You are listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Adam Rosen. I'm a fellowship-trained, board-certified orthopedic surgeon who specializes in knee replacement. Here I'll talk to you about common knee complaints and other orthopedic issues. We'll cover other important health-related topics, all of which are meant to helpfully answer some of your questions and help improve the quality of your life. Thanks for listening, and on with the next episode. Hello and welcome back. My name is Adam Rosen and you're listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. Well, one of the more common questions that I get asked from patients and something that I go into detail with every patient prior to surgery is what an actual knee replacement is or what we actually do. Because a lot of people don't have a very good understanding or grasp of what goes on. I think a lot of people, and when I talk to them, a lot of people admit that they really think we kind of chop out a huge chunk of their knee and drop in this hinge. And Although we do have implants like that where you're almost a metal terminator, um, that's not common. You know, those are things that we use typically for people with tumors or people that may have had prior knee replacements and fell and broke the bone around the implant and the bone is just not reconstructible. And the entire distal part of the thigh bone or the end of the thigh bone where the ligaments even normally attach all gets removed and a metal basically skeleton gets placed Um, And the parts bolt together. There's actually a bolt or a hinge that locks the shin bone to the thigh bone portion. So they're functional and they allow people to get up and stand, um, but they're not normal and they don't function like a normal knee or a normal total knee. And a lot of times the longevity of those implants is not as good because there's a lot of stress on the bone Um, and they don't bend and, and rotate the way a normal knee or a normal total knee does. Um, So yes, they are there, but that's not typically what we do. So what happens in a normal total knee replacement um, is obviously there's an incision. So I have a lot of people ask, you know, can you do this arthroscopically? And that's impossible. You know, we can't make two or three small little incisions and put instruments in there like we would treat a meniscus tear and put a knee replacement in. It's just impossible. The parts are big enough. They wouldn't fit through those tiny holes. So there is an incision. And typically the incision is over the front of the knee. Now, once you go through the front of the knee, you're staring at what's called the extensor mechanism. And the extensor mechanism is a blend of the tendons and the bone that allow you to straighten your knee. And we have to make an incision in that area to get the kneecap and that um, what's called uh, the capsule or basically the bag that surrounds your knee joint open so we get access to the inside of your knee joint. And there's lots of different types of incisions that you can make, and they have their pros and their cons, and each surgeon may have his preference or may do it based on your body type or habitus or anatomy. So once we make the incision around the kneecap and into this extensor mechanism, the kneecap can get pushed or slid out of the way, and now you're looking at the knee joint. So what we then do is, and it it may not be exactly in this order or sequence, um, but you have to release soft tissue that's tight, So if somebody's bow-legged or knock-kneed, you may have to release the tighter structures. If they have bone spurs, you have to release the bone spurs. Most arthritic knees do not have an ACL or anterior cruciate ligament. And for all implants, except for one, um, we remove the ACL even if it's there. The one that is on the market is uh, good in theory, but it has not become very commonplace and standard. Um, So typically for modern knee replacements now, the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament, if it's there, gets removed. All of your remaining meniscus tissue gets removed. Now, the other ligament in the middle of the knee called the PCL or posterior cruciate ligament may stay if it's intact, um, or it may be removed, and the plastic inserts may make up for whether or not your ligament is left in place, or whether or not the ligament's there but weak or thin, or whether or not the ligament is removed. Now, once you've done the soft tissue work, the ligaments on the inside and outside, what we call the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, they stay. We work between those, and there's little metal guides or what we call retractors that are placed to protect those ligaments during the procedure. And then there's three main bony procedures that get performed during the knee replacement. So one of the things that's done, not in all cases, but a majority of knee replacements, the back of the kneecap or the patella is what's called resurfaced. In some patients, and some doctors prefer to leave the cartilage if the cartilage looks good and healthy. Now, the upside is by leaving your cartilage, 
you're removing less of your bone and cartilage and less of your body. Um, and by thinning that bone out, the kneecap out, to replace it or to resurface it, there always is a risk that if you cut it thin, it may be at a greater risk of breaking or what's called a fracture. The downside of leaving it is there's a lot of people with knee pain in the front of the knee with arthritis and with knee replacements. So if you don't have the back of your kneecap resurfaced and then you have knee pain, the question always is there is, is the knee pain just there because you had a knee replacement and surgery or is the knee pain there because somebody didn't resurface the back of your kneecap? And sometimes that obligates somebody to then a second operation down the road where someone has to go back in and do another operation. So the time is a a minor issue. There's some people that say, well, it takes a lot of time. It doesn't really take a lot of time as far as minutes to resurface the back of the kneecap, but it does add a couple minutes of time. So what some people will do is leave it and they'll trim off any bone spurs and do some soft tissue releases to decrease pain in that area. What I'll typically do, though, is resurface it. So what we do is we use a saw, or some people will use a little, um, what's called a grater or reamer, and what we're trying to do is flatten out the backside of the kneecap, so you're removing the cartilage and a little bit of bone to get a flat surface, and then we have different, what we call buttons. So basically, these are like little tiny domes made of plastic in different sizes to fit your anatomy, and they have different thicknesses, and you're trying to replace the bad cartilage with this piece of plastic and restoring it to the appropriate thickness or height. So that's the kneecap portion. Typically, we're removing about a third of your kneecap, so two-thirds of your bone is left. And this way, why after surgery, if you touch your knee from the front, it's your bone. It's your patella because that's where the tendons attach. So we want to leave that. But if you could take your kneecap and flip it upside down, the backside you would see is plastic. Now, on the thigh bone part, then what we do is a series of cuts. And you can do this a couple different ways. There's different types of what we call intramedullary guides where we drill a small hole in the bone and drop a rod in. You can use a navigation machine, which allows you to put points on a computer and that helps figure out where the cut needs to be and the angles and positions. You can use other robots that are robotic arms that again use the same sort of information from CAT scans and findings that you can plot during surgery, and using that arm, you can make a cut. There are little handheld devices, almost look like little smartphones that you can attach. And then you can also make these custom blocks. So there's a lot of different ways to do this procedure, but essentially what we're doing is cutting off some bone and cartilage on the end of your thigh bone, and that typically has a certain amount of thickness depending on your knee, where you're knock kneed or bow-legged, or where you're pretty straight, how much cartilage was lost on one side versus the other, and how thick is the implant. Most most implants are about eight or nine millimeters, so that's what we're essentially trying to remove is about eight or nine millimeters of cartilage, plus or minus you have to factor in how much cartilage the person has lost based on their arthritis. So now you've made a cut on the very end of the thigh bone, the end of the femur, and that's set at a certain position or angle to balance the knee. Now, at this point, typically what we'll do is whether or not you're using jigs or measuring devices or a computer, you're going to size because every individual is going to have a different size thigh bone. So once you determine the exact size, then you have to use these gadgets or instruments or computers to then set the position from front to back, side to side, and a certain amount of rotation, and these blocks get pinned in place to that fresh cut that you made on the end of the thigh bone. And then we typically make a series of cuts. These are typically called four and one blocks because it's one block and you make four cuts from them typically. So you make a cut across the front and typically this makes the cut flush with the front of your thigh bone. So typically there'd be a little ridge there of cartilage and some bone where the kneecap rides. We're removing that because that's gonna be made up with the thigh bone part. And then you take off similar amount of bone and cartilage off the back of the knee And then between the back and the front cuts and the end cut, you make these little angled cuts we call chamfers. So it has this geometric shape. And at this point now, you've prepared the thigh bone or you've prepared the femur, essentially removing about eight or nine millimeters of bone and cartilage off the front, the end, and the back. Now, the third bony preparation part is the shin bone or your tibia. So again, we remove the meniscus 
And now you can either use a rod that goes inside the shin bone or a rod that gets aligned across the front of the shin bone or one of these computerized gadgets or robotic arms. But what you're trying to do is make a flat cut on the top of the shin bone. Now, typically, we'll only remove a few millimeters of cartilage off the bad side but you have to remove enough cartilage and bone to make up for the total knee implant, which is typically made of metal and plastic. So once you've made this flat cut, now you've made all your bone cuts for the knee. So essentially, in essence, we're only removing about a centimeter of bone. You know, when you look at the leg straight, again, a lot of people think we take, you know, four or five, six inches and chop out that whole hinge. We're really taking about eight or nine millimeters off the end of the thigh bone and about two or four millimeters off the top of the shin bone. So a very, very small amount. Now, what we do on the shin bone, just like we did on the thigh bone, is we size it. So typically we have these templates, look like little oval-shaped or lima bean-shaped templates for the size of the shin bone, and it may either be a right or left, or some implants are just oval, so they'll fit either side, and you figure out which size fits the top of the bone the best. And then once again, you have to set the appropriate rotation. So there's a lot of three-dimensional balancing that goes on with these knee replacements to make sure that the knee bends and straightens in its normal fashion and the ligaments are well-balanced. And at this point, once we figure out the sizes, we can do what's called trialing. So what a trial is, is you can put a part on top of the shin bone and you can put the thigh bone part on. It's not the real part. And then we can put a plastic button on the back of the kneecap and a plastic insert between the shin bone and the thigh bone, and now you can check the patient's motion. We can actually take your knee and straighten it and bend it and check the ligaments and the stability and take it through the normal functions and then decide, can we go up or down in the thickness of the plastic? Was the knee too loose or too tight? It's almost like what we teach the Goldilocks theory where sometimes one millimeter makes a big difference. You know, you put a 10 millimeter plastic in and it's just right. You know, you try an 11 and it's way too tight, doesn't, doesn't straighten all the way. Or you put a, a nine in and then he's way too loose. Um, so we have the options of different thickness plastics. And for most parts on most implant companies, all of these are interchangeable. So you can use a shin bone size that can match multiple thickness plastics. And usually it can mate with one, two, three, or more different size thigh bone or femoral components and different plastic inserts. So you have this infinite combination that allows you to sort of custom fit it for each individual patient. So once we've figured out the appropriate balancing, now you can remove all those what we call trial parts, and then you open up the individual parts. So each of those parts comes sterilized in a special box. You've decided what size kneecap portion or patella button, what size thigh bone portion or femoral component, what size shin bone portion or tibial component, and the thickness of the plastic. And now we can wash and prepare the bone. Now, most people will use cement, but we also have what's called press fit implants. So in a person with good bone quality and no significant risk factors, the back of the implants have special coatings and allows you to intimately fit this on the bone. The bone has to grow in to the actual back of the metal or the implant to make it solid. Um, but for most people and most doctors currently will still use cement. So what we do is we prepare the cement on the back table and it gets applied to the bony surfaces. So it acts as a grout and it works well under compression. So now we take the shin bone part and we put that in, put the plastic part in, put the thigh bone part in. So imagine if you take your left hand and make a fist. This is the end of your thigh bone with your bone cuts. And your right hand, you open up your hand like a letter C. Now you've put cement on your fist and you take that C-shaped implant and it goes on the end of your thigh bone. And that's the way that it fits with the cuts that we've made previously. And then the last part is you put some cement on the back side of the kneecap and put that plastic button on. And there's clamps and ways to mate these to the ends of the bone. And we can hold this in the appropriate position while the cement fully cures, which typically takes eight to 12 minutes. So once the cement's hard and cured, then we can again check the range of motion and check the stability. And then just the way that we went in, we go the same way out. So you'll close the what's called arthrotomy, or we talked about the bag of tissue that surrounds your knee. So you usually close that with some stitches, and then you can close the what we call subcutaneous tissue, which is the tissue outside of the knee joint but below the skin, and then close the skin in some form or fashion. Put on dressings, wake the patient up, get them off to the recovery room, and typically later that day, they're either going home or starting physical therapy, depending on the time and your location. So I hope that really helps explain to you just the actual steps 
of what actually goes on for knee replacement. Um, I will try to throw in some links in the show notes um, because I do have some videos up on YouTube. Um, for those that don't like seeing the gore, um, usually the podcast is great, and I have this in a written form also. Some people actually are interested in seeing, so we have some pictures and some slideshows of what all of those steps are, so you can kind of watch in a slideshow presentation of what actually happens to the kneecap, you know, and what actually happens during a knee replacement, so you can get a good visual of all of the things that I just talked about. So I hope that answers some of the questions that you may have had if you're looking at or heading into a knee replacement in the near future. So once again, thanks for listening. If you have somebody that you think would benefit from this information, please pass on the link to them. And again, I'm Adam Rosen. You've been listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. Until next time, stay safe. Thanks for listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. If you've not already done so, please subscribe so you'll be notified of future episodes. And if you enjoy what you're hearing, please take the time to leave a review. It helps other people like you find the show. I'm your host, Adam Rosen, and until next time, stay safe.